Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. Today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different and I'm going to be telling you all about an American case that was specifically requested to me by a TikTok commenter. Today I'm going to tell you all about the Caffey family massacre and how their daughter Erin, who was once an innocent church girl, schemed to murder her entire family. This case takes place in Rains County, Texas in 2008. The Caffey family consists of parents, Terry and Penny, and the children are Erin, Matthew and Tyler. The Caffeys were a pretty typical all-American conservative family. They were very involved in their local Baptist church where both parents worked as ministers. Penny would play piano at the church and Erin sang in the choir. They were a very musical family. Both the boys played instruments, Matthew enjoyed the harmonica and Tyler liked to play the guitar. Life at home for the children was great. There was an abundance of love between them all. There was never any shouting, any hitting or anything like that. They were just a family who were full of love and they were just so happy. Erin, being the oldest, had a particularly good, comfortable life. She would go to youth camp where she had many friends and was a well-liked person. This reflected in her being voted most likely to succeed and best fun-loving person. She had a part-time job at a fast food restaurant where she would use rollerblades to deliver food and Terry had bought her her first car because he was just so proud of her. Despite all of this, Erin would later say that during this time she was actually experiencing a lot of loneliness and isolation due to her homeschooling. She had been going to public school, however she was pulled out after she and another girl exchanged a kiss. Terry and Penny had found out about this and the thought of any sort of bisexuality or lesbianism was totally against their beliefs so they pulled her out of public school and began to homeschool her. The people that Erin worked with said that she was quote, so sheltered it was like she was seeing the world for the first time. It was while at work 16 year old Erin met 18 year old Charles Wilkinson. There is another Charles in the case a bit further down, so when referring to Charles Wilkinson, I'm just going to call him Charlie. Charlie came from a background that was the very opposite of what Aaron's was. His home life was broken and he basically lived with one of his friends who was named Justin and his mom named Teresa Myers. Charlie had a very strong bond with Teresa. He would consider her as his mother and he called her as such. He trusted her, he confided in her and he loved her. Erin and Charlie began a romantic relationship much to the disapproval of Terry and Penny who from the start were not overly taken by him. Terry would say that he always had an off feeling about Charlie, just something about him just didn't seem right. As their relationship progressed, Erin's behaviour began to change. She wasn't her kind and happy young self. She started to rebel, staying out past her curfew and arguing with her mother. Terry had had some confrontations with Charlie over the course of their relationship. The biggest one being when Charlie had presented Erin with his grandmother's engagement ring. Now this wasn't like a proper full-on proposal or anything like that but it made Charlie's intentions to Erin crystal clear. Terry told Charlie that Erin was far too young for such a big commitment like this and gave the ring back. And the tip of the iceberg for Terry and Penny was when they went online and came across Charlie's MySpace account where on here he would post about drinking alcohol and he would boast about having sex with numerous girls. Now again, the Caffies are very religious and they are very firm in their beliefs. So this, coupled with the fact that Erin is only 16 years old, didn't sit right with them. So they told Erin that she had to end things with them. Very much to their surprise, Erin did not protest this. She kind of dropped her head and was a little bit sad, but she told her parents that she was actually planning on ending the relationship anyways. The disapproval of their relationship wasn't just one-sided to Erin's family. Teresa had her own reservations about the relationship. She recalled a time when Charlie and Justin, who again is her son, had came home late from school. 
When she contacted Charlie, he told her that he was at the police station because he was worried for Erin. Erin had told Charlie that she was in danger and that she was getting abused and being scared for her. Charlie had went to make a report to the police. Teresa questioned this, asking if he had actually seen anything happen or if he had seen any bruises as proof or anything like that, which he hadn't. He was just taking Erin's word for it. I couldn't find if he had actually ended up making the report. I don't think that he did, but from here, Teresa had her suspicions against Erin. She believed that Erin was manipulating Charlie because she knew that he was completely taken by her. He was infatuated with her. The 27th of February, 2008 was a pretty normal day. After attending church, Erin went to see Charlie and was supposed to be breaking up with him. When seeing Charlie, she told him of the ultimatum that her parents gave her, but then also offered a solution. She told him that the only way they could be together were if her parents were killed. Charlie supposedly did propose other ideas, such as simply running away or even impregnating Erin so then her parents would have to accept their relationship, but Erin did not want any of these. She was very firm that the only solution would be if her parents were killed. They made a code word, which was FUMBA, which doesn't really have any sort of meaning, but they both knew that whenever they were using this word, they were discussing the pendant murders. Around midnight, three days later, on the 1st of March, Bobby Johnson and her boyfriend, Charles Wade, picked up Charlie and took him to Erin's house. The boys were armed with guns and samurai swords, so everyone in the car knew what was going to happen. When they arrived, the Caffey family dog started to bark at the arrival of the car, so they turned around and left. Over the course of this time, Erin was ringing Charlie over and over, over a dozen times, checking where they were and giving instructions. And on the last call, she said, quote, where are you? I'll take care of the dog. I'll keep the dog quiet. You need to come back. And so off they went back to the house and picked up Erin. They then drove to a cemetery where they sat for an hour discussing what they were about to do. When they arrived back at the house, they parked further down the road. Before leaving, Charlie turned to Erin and told her that if he was going to do this, he could not leave any witnesses, so her eight and 13 year old brothers would have to be killed too. To this, Erin responded coldly, quote, I don't care, just do what you gotta do. And so off Charlie and Charles went, leaving Erin and Bobby in the car. During this whole period, directly before the murders, Erin supposedly never reconsidered or showed any doubt or hesitation about what she wanted to happen. Charlie and Charles had made entry into the house through a door that Erin had conveniently left open for them. Charlie wasn't a stranger to the house. He had spent a lot of time there, he had ate there, he had spent many hours there with Erin and with her family, so he knew his way around it and he knew exactly where everyone's bedrooms were. Terry recalls it being around 2am when his bedroom door burst open, slamming against the wall, awakening him. In those first few dazed and confused seconds of being woken up, Terry initially thought that it was Tyler stood at the door after having a nightmare, but little did he know he was about to be in a real nightmare. It was not Tyler at the door, it was Charlie who instantly began firing bullets into the room. The shooting was aimed at Terry and Penny. Terry would be shot at least 11 times and while shooting at Penny, the gun jammed. This is when they bared the samurai sword and began an attack on Penny, almost decapitating her. Throughout this, Terry is in and out of consciousness. Hearing all the commotion and recognising the attacker, Matthew shouted from upstairs, quote, Charlie, Charlie, why are you doing this? No, Charlie, no. Please, why are you doing this? Both Charlie and Charles ascended the stairs to the bedroom of Matthew and Tyler. It was Charles who shot 13 year old Matthew and then they both took turns stabbing eight year old Tyler to death. He had been so terrified that he had attempted to hide in his closet. 
After this, Charles and Charlie had stolen money and a safe before dousing the house in light of fluid and setting it alight. By now, Terry had regained consciousness, managed to get to his feet and tried to race to his boys upstairs. But when he opened his bedroom door, he was met with a wall of fire blocking him in. He was forced back into the bedroom where he turned to see his wife lay on the bed and he knew straight away that she was dead. Because he was in and out of consciousness, he didn't know the fate of his children. He didn't know if his boys were dead or alive. He didn't know if Erin was dead or alive. He just knew that he needed to get help. And remember, Terry has been shot 11 times. He is losing tons of blood and he is still trying to do whatever he can to cling on to life to get help for his family, telling himself, quote, if I die here, I may not be able to tell who did this. I've got to stay alive to identify the killers. The house was now engulfed in flames, so the only way out was through the bathroom window of their ensuite. Somehow Terry had managed to climb up to the window and kind of throw himself out falling from the first floor to the ground. Looking back on their home he knew that his family was gone. The house was roaring with huge flames and the roof had begun to collapse. He crawled 500 yards to his neighbour Tommy's house and this took him over an hour. It was around 5am that the 911 call for help was made by Tommy. The operator asked Tommy where Terry was bleeding from, to which he replied, quote, where isn't he bleeding from? Terry's first words to the first officer that came to see him were, quote, they're all gone. Followed by, quote, Charlie Wilkinson shot my whole family. Terry was then rushed to the hospital with his severe injuries. He was in bad shape, covered in blood, mud and soot but he was alive. After the murders, Bobby and Charles dropped Charlie and Erin off at his brother's trailer. In the car drive, when describing the events of what had just happened, Erin responded to it saying, quote, holy shit, that was awesome. While her whole family were dead or dying and her home was burned to the ground, Erin and Charlie laughed, joked and had sex. Back at the scene, firefighters tried their best to put the fire out. The house was well past being able to save and was eventually reduced to ash, dust and debris. The charred bodies of 39-year-old Penny, 13-year-old Matthew and 8-year-old Tyler were all found, but where was Erin? After Terry's tip-off of who had done this to his family, the police zoned in on the trailer. Charlie was arrested and a search of the trailer was carried out. It was so messy and cluttered that they didn't even know where to start. There was a mattress on the floor, there was clothes and mess just thrown and scattered everywhere. And an officer spotted what he at first thought was a wig. He went to pick it up to move it out of the way just to realise that this was actually Erin's hair. Upon her hair being pulled, Erin's eyes shot open and she began her tale of lies. All four of the accomplices were arrested and questioned. Erin initially fabricated a very convincing story. She told investigators that she had woken up and her room was full of smoke. She was then kidnapped at knife point and drugged and that the officer who pulled her hair was the first thing that she remembered from being drugged. The clothes that she was wearing was taken in for evidence and she also had a toxicology test run. Both of these would aid in proving Erin's lies. Her clothes, first of all, had no smell of smoke on them, which showed that she wasn't in the house at the time of the fire. She showed no signs of smoke inhalation, which again she would have had she been in a room full of smoke. And her toxicology report had came back showing that she had not had any drugs in her system that would cause memory loss. I don't know if it was a completely clean test and there was no drugs at all, but 
definitely there was at least nothing on there that would have caused other memory loss. Her phone and text records also showed her part in planning the murders. And maybe some of the most damning evidence to show Erin's deception was the fact that all of her accomplices made her out to be the ringleader. Now I guess when something like this, it's quite normal for everyone to try and point fingers and to try and deflect the blame off themselves. But usually when this happens, there are details that are missing, there are details that kind of clash, there's discrepancies. But what Charles, Charlie and Bobby all told investigators about Erin matched perfectly. During his questioning, Charlie admitted to shooting Terry but denied shooting Matthew. He explained to investigators that the whole murder plan was Erin's idea. It was her solely, she wanted to do it and he even told investigators how he wanted to do something else like the running away or impregnating her but Erin wanted the murders to happen and she pushed him to do it. Charlie truly believed that Erin was his soulmate, was the love of his life, that they were going to spend the rest of their lives together so when Erin told him that this is what she really wanted, he complied out of love for her. Bobby told the investigators that Erin had told Charlie over and over about the abuse that she suffered from her parents and she kind of used this as Charlie's motivation to get him in on the murders. Again, this was something that just was not true. There was not any violence in the house and investigators even said that Erin showed no signs of abuse. There wasn't a single scratch on her. Charles Wade said he agreed to help in the murders because he was promised a payment of $2,000. Erin, Charlie, Charles and Bobby were all charged with capital murder and because they're in Texas that meant the death penalty was on the table. Initially Terry wanted to pursue the death penalty for the two boys that massacred his family but he did eventually request they be spared the death penalty saying quote my heart tells me there has been enough deaths. I want them in this lifetime to have a chance for remorse and come to a place of repentance for what they have done. Killing them will not bring my family back. Charles and Charlie would go on to be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Bobby is serving a minimum sentence of 20 years and Erin is serving a minimum sentence of 42 years. Terry holds out hope that he will live to see the day his daughter is no longer behind bars. Despite being fully aware of Erin's involvement in the murders, Terry has stood by her. He stood by her through the whole trial and has stood by her since. He told her that even if it was her that had pulled the trigger, he would still love her and he will continue to love her through thick and thin. This was very controversial, but Terry doesn't care about anyone else's opinion. I think it's very easy for us to form our own opinions too, like if Erin hadn't planned and pushed this murder, Penny, Matthew and Tyler would all still be alive. But to Terry, Erin is all he has left of that life, she's all he has left of that family unit and all he has left of his children, so mentally, could he lose her as well? Many people say that he is in denial and he says that this is not true. He understands Erin's involvement in the murders, but he believes that she was just an easily led 16 year old girl who got mixed in with the wrong person. Terry has finally got to a place where he can forgive Erin. He has forgiven the other three accomplices and the last person he forgave was himself and he said that that was the hardest. For a long time after the murders, Terry would sleep with a gun on his chest in his hands. Most nights he would experience nightmares, hearing the screams of his family or hearing the gunshots that killed them. Terry visits Erin at the Hilltop unit in Gatesville, Texas as much as he can. He is now remarried and has stepchildren. He wrote a book titled Terror by Night which details the night of the murders and he also co-wrote a book named Blind Sight. Erin is still incarcerated and she has said the first thing that she wants to do when she gets released is go to the graves of Penny, Matthew and Tyler and pay her respects. And that is today's case. It is a truly devastating case and just shows that these cold, callous, calculated killers can come from any background really. 
I know that a lot of these killers are stereotyped to come from these really bad and not so great backgrounds, but killers can come from anywhere. I think that Terry Caffey is one of the strongest people that I have ever heard of. How he has managed to forgive these people who ripped his family away from him and is building a new, better relationship with Erin. Like I said earlier, Terry gets a lot of hate for his forgiveness of his daughter, but he doesn't care. Erin is his daughter and he stands by her, he loves her and he forgives her. Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. I have linked all of my social media in the description box below if you would like to follow me on any of my other platforms. I also cover true crime cases on my TikTok as well. I have linked all of my source material in the description box too. Please don't forget to like and share this video and if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any of my future uploads. Again, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all on my next one.